contained in this court across the channel in the kingdom near France was a fine knight and his lady wife. He was much beloved by his king, but lived far away from his king, so the king did not see him very often. And his wife had a concern, because once a month, he left their manor and disappeared for a week. And she kept asking him, why do you leave and go off into the forest and not return for a week? And he says, I can't tell you. I cannot tell you. Slowly, bit by bit, she wore him down until finally one day he said, I must go into the woods once a month because I turn into a wolf. Well, you can only imagine the shock on her face when she was told this. She says, well, but you, what happens? He says, I ride to, there's an old chapel in the woods where I can leave my horse and I can take my clothes off and I turn into a wolf for a week and then I come back and put my clothes back on and come back to the manor. And she said, well, what happens if the horse and the clothes are gone when you come back? He says, I will always remain a wolf. I will never turn back into a man. Well, she had some thoughts about this. She, she, she couldn't imagine sleeping next to, in a bed next to a man who turns into a wolf. It just disgusted her. And she didn't know what to do. And then she had a thought. There was a young knight in the area who had been wooing her, who wanted her to be his lover. And so she called him forward and said, the next time my husband goes away from the manor, you will follow him, you will find his horse and release it, and you will find his clothes and hide them. She explained why. She said, if you do this, once he has been declared dead, I will marry you, and you will inherit the manor, and we will live together as man and wife. So they agreed. And yet, indeed, in the next month, when our knight left his manor, the younger knight followed him into the woods, saw him disrobe, fold all his clothes up, put them away, turn his horse out into a paddock nearby, and disappear into the woods. And so the young knight came up, took the clothes, dug a hole, buried them a ways away, and released the horse. Well, the horse came back to the manor. And at first people thought perhaps it had been a hunting accident, something had happened to the, our knight, but slowly over the weeks and the months when he did not return, it was determined that he must be dead. Either the brigands in the woods got him, or it was a hunting accident, or got him, something happened, and he was dead. So his wife was declared a widow, she married her young knight, and they lived happily in the manor house. Well, word came to the king of a great wolf that had appeared in his woods, in his forests, who was hunting down his deer, and so he set out with a hunting team to capture and kill this wolf. And they moved through the woods, and his dog team worked everywhere, and finally they caught a scent. And there was a mad scramble, and they could see the wolf in the distance running away, and the huntsmen and the king and all of his knights went after them. And finally the wolf, the dogs penned the wolf in, and the king took his spear and was moving forward to kill it, and suddenly the wolf, instead of fighting with the wolf dogs, lay down on his belly and bowed his head to the king. The king stopped with raised spear. He says, I cannot kill this wolf, said this to his huntsmen. He has bowed to me. He has given himself to me the way one of my men would. Put a rope around his neck and we will take him back to court. The huntsman was like, your majesty, 
This is a wild animal. He will kill everybody. No, no, no. I trust him. I trust him. So indeed, they took a, wolf, a hank of rope, and the wolf trotted along next to the king's horse all the way back to court, slept by the king's bed, ate with the king, came out with the king when the king was in court, perfectly calm. Until one day, the young knight, who had buried the clothes of our knight, was in court. And suddenly the wolf was not calm anymore. His ears went up, his teeth appeared, he growled and snarled as the young knight walked through the hall. The king had to grab his collar and hold him back. And the, and the, the young knight shuddered in fright and ran from the room. And the huntsman came and said, sit, 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 something's wrong. This, this wolf is going to kill people. He said, no, 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 it's okay. He calmed down as soon as there must have been something, he smelled something on that young knight. Well, several days later, the widow of our knight, now married to the young knight, was serving the king his breakfast in his chambers. And as she entered, the wolf came off the bed, knocked her to the floor, and bit her nose off. And the king said, grab the wolf and drag him back. And again, look what, he, what the wolf has done. Look what this wolf has done. He's mauled this beautiful woman. And a wise man stood up and said, Your Majesty, isn't it odd that the former wife of the knight who disappeared and the man she's now married to are the only two people in court this wolf has attacked? There is something going on here. Let us take them down to the dungeons and talk to them. <laughs> So they did, and the story came out. And they came back to the, the king and said, this is what has happened. And he said, well, if we find his clothes, perhaps he will turn back into my knight. So they sent a team out to the chapel, and they probed and they looked, and finally they found the clothes. They dug them up, they brought them back. And the king spread them out in front of the wolf and stood there watching. And nothing happened. Well, just like a dog, good dog. And finally, the wise man said, "Well, Your Majesty, maybe he doesn't. Maybe it's kind of like a private thing to turn back into, you know, naked. He'd be all naked." Okay. So he spread the clothes out on the bed in his chambers, closed the door, and waited, and waited, and waited, and waited, and finally creaked open the door. And there, asleep on his bed, sound asleep with his knight, his favorite knight, dressed in his warm clothes, sound asleep. And so the moral of this story is, if you ever have a wolf in your bed, don't give him up to the younger knight in the woods. Just settle for it. <laughs> <laughs> story actually comes from the court of King Arthur. It's a version of the loathly lady story that was told in a number of countries and eras throughout Europe. This one is based on the wife of Bath's tale. Once, when Arthur was ruling in Camelot, there was a lusty young knight out riding and he saw a lovely young lady and her squire riding along the river. And he rode up behind the squire and knocked him from his horse and took the reins of the lady's horse and took her back to his manor. Well, things happen as they will when there's a lusty knight and a young lady, but her father did not. So he called upon King Arthur to put the young knight on trial and charged him with rape and molestation of his daughter. And the king held a trial and found the 
that the knight was guilty and sentenced him to death. Well, Guinevere had kind of come to like this young knight. And she came to Arthur and said, Will you let me and my ladies judge him as well? And he said, My queen, I love you. This man has done foul deeds. He said, But if you wish to judge him as well, I will let you do that. So she called the young knight forward and she said, I will give you a bone. I will have the king wipe away your sentence of death if you can tell me what every woman truly wants. Well, the young knight was thinking, well, I can at least try. Let him die. So she said, the queen then said, you have a year and a day. You must ride out now, and a year and a day you must be back to tell me and all my ladies at the court what a woman truly wants. Well, he rode out and he stopped at every town, every inn. He asked everybody he could think of. Some people said money. Women want money. Some people said they want a great lover. But each, each thing just didn't seem to ring true to him. Well, the year went by. He, was, he rode all over Britain. He told all sorts. Each person seemed to have a different opinion about what women truly wanted. And he was a day's ride from Camelot returning because he'd been out riding for a year. And off in the distance, he saw a fairy circle. And he saw fairies dancing in the circle. And he said, well, I've asked humans. Maybe the fairies will know. So he rode towards the fairy circle, and they all disappeared. And yet, they are sitting in the middle of the circle is probably the ugliest, oldest woman he'd ever met. And she was sitting there on a stump in the middle of the circle, and she said, Young Knight, I know what you need and what you want, and I have your answer. If I tell you the answer, and the queen agrees with it, the next thing I ask you, you must do for me. And his thought was, well, I'm going to die. If I don't get some answer that the queen and her ladies want, it's a gamble, but I'll take it. So he mounted her up on the back of his horse, and they rode back to Camelot. And they got into the royal hall. Guinevere called her ladies forward, and the lovely lady leaned over and whispered in our knight's ear, and he said, what every woman want, truly wants, is the sovereignty over her husband that she has over her lover. Well, Guinevere blinked a few times, looked around, some women nodded, some women smiled, but nobody said no. That's not what women want. And she said, well, but you seem to have learned this from this old woman. How did you meet her? So he explained what he had done. And the woman finally spoke up and said, Your Majesty, this knight has promised that the next thing I ask him after telling him what the answer is, he will do. And the man, one of her said, Well, what is that? He will marry me today. Now it was our knight's turn to blink and stumble back. This woman old and tiny and crotchety and just ugly. But he had sworn his oath. So there was a wedding. Not a very happy wedding, but a wedding. And then they were all, he and the woman were taken to the bed chambers and the door was closed. And she got into bed and drew the curtains and he sat in the chair said to himself, I'm not getting in that bed. I'm not getting in that bed with that ugly thing. He heard a voice from behind the curtains, a slightly different voice than she had had before. It seemed like a younger voice. She said, my husband, are you not coming to bed on our wedding night? He said, well, uh, yes, I have to. Do you 
what? Drew the curtains back. And there was a beautiful young maiden where the young, ugly woman had lain before. And he said, what? 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 She said, I'm under a curse. I can, I'm a beautiful, I'm a, my true self, a beautiful young maiden, half the day, and a great old woman the rest of the day. You have the choice of what I should be. Should I be a beautiful woman, young woman, when all of your knightly friends will see me and perhaps think evil thoughts? Or would you rather just have me a beautiful woman only to yourself at night? And he thought, he thought, he said, it is your choice, it is your choice, wife. And she said, so you are giving me sovereignty over your, yourself to decide. And he said, yes. She said, very well, the curse has been broken. I will now only be a beautiful young lady all the time. And so they lived in the court of Arthur as long as they could, as long as they were happy. And that's the end of this story. Good job. Good job. I have one more story. If you let me. Pardon? You live apart. I'm fine. It had been a long, wet, cold spring. We know about that. <laughs> no, really? Yeah. And Robin Hood was bored. There had been no travelers through Sherwood Forest because it was too muddy, it was too wet, it was too dark, it was too cold. But finally, one early May day, the sun came out, the road dried up, and so he said, Robin said to little John and his men, we must go to the high road and see who comes to us. And they've been out there all day, and it was getting a little tiring. And Robin was thinking about dinner, when up the road came a rather shabbily dressed man with a sword riding towards Nottingham. And Robin stepped out into the road and said, Hall, what do you do in my forest? And the man put his hand on his sword and said, Who are you to ask? And Robin said, I am Robin Hood. This is my forest, and nobody rides through without paying the toll. Who are you? And the man on the horse said, I am Sir William Atlee, recently returned from the Holy Land where we was fighting with our king. And Robin said, well, what brings you to our forest? And the knight said, I am riding to Nottingham to meet the abbot of St. Mary's Monastery from whom I borrowed money to, so I could travel to the Holy Land. Robin said, well, it is late. You must come eat dinner with me and tell me your whole story and we will Please see what we can help you with. And the knight said, well, I've heard good, both good things and bad things about Robin Hood. Some say he's a good yeoman, and some say he's a varlet and a thief. And Robin said, well, have dinner with me, and you can make your own decision. So they took him through the woods to where they had their settlement, had him, had, fed him some, some good beer, and the knight started to tell his story. He said, three years ago, when I left for the Holy Land, I could not afford to go. So I borrowed a hundred pounds from the abbot of St. Mary's and mortgaged my, my manor to it. And I was sure that in three years my manor would make enough money, enough uh, profit so that I could have a hundred pounds when I came back to return to the abbot. So I have returned, but in my absence, my wife and my sons did the best they can, could. But our barn burned down, the cows got into the crops, the horses got away. It was just a disastrous time, and we made no money. We're barely, barely keeping by. Well, at the same time, 
The abbot was in Nottingham sitting with his prior, talking to his prior about the expected visit he was having from this night. And the prior said, it's really too bad all those awful things happened to this night. So that he probably doesn't have the money to pay you back and you'll be able to take his manor and make it part of our abbey. And the abbot said, yes, yes, it is really terrible, awful things happen. Wink, wink, march, nudge. So, the next morning, the knight got up and prepared to leave. And little John said, we can't have this guest of ours leaving, dressed the way he is. We must give him fine raiment to show, to, to take his meeting with the abbot. And Robin, so Robin and little John and all the men brought forward clothing and found things that would fit and were fine, much finer looking than what he had been wearing. And then William, and then one of the other men said, well, he needs a better horse. He can't ride into Nottingham on the horse he's on. So they loaned him a horse. And little John said, there are dangerous places between here and Nottingham where he will be riding. I will ride along as his squire. And then Robin came forward with a bag with chinks of money. He said, Sir Knight, I will loan you a hundred pounds to pay the abbot. And then I said, I can't, I can't. Robin said, no, it's fine. You take this bag. Take this receipt, make sure he signs and stamps the receipt, seals the receipt, you have returned his money. So the knight mounted up on his fine new horse, little John mounted up behind him, and they rode off towards Nottingham. Well, the abbot and his prior were also having breakfast, and suddenly the knight was called into their hall, and there he was. Fine, even though the abbot had been told that he was not in any condition to be wearing fine new clothes with a hulking big squire standing behind him. And he came forward and he poured out the coins onto the table and he said, Count every one. And the abbot, and the abbot carefully counted one, two, one hundred. One hundred pounds. The knight brought forward the receipt and said, sign this and, and seal it, that I have paid you in full. And the abbot did, and he didn't want to, but he did. And the knight rolled it up, tied it up, and left. And so the knight rode home, back to his manor place, and the abbot packed all of his things up, took the gold, sack of gold and put it in his strong box, and he and his retinue set off back to the abbey, to the monastery. Well, just as they reached the high road in Sherwood Forest, the great horn blew, and Robin Hood and his men appeared all around them. And his men at arms drew their swords and then realized the long bows of Robin's men would pick them off from a distance, so they put them back. Robin stepped up to the abbot and said, My Lord Abbot, what do you do in my woods? Abbot said, I just had some business in Nottingham and now I'm going home. I'm a poor abbot. And at that, Robin looked down the long line of retinue. And I have no extra money. And Robin looked at the fine horses that every one of the men was riding. He said, Well, I only take a toll from those who can afford to give me a toll. Otherwise, I will let them go. And about that time, little John brought forth the strong box and set it down in the road. Robin said, that's a mighty big strong box for somebody who has no money. And I said, oh, it's just papers, papers. I don't, I, you know, I don't want them damaged. Robin says, do you have a key to the lock? Uh, I, no, I, 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 I don't know. Little John opened the box, <coughs> took an axe and opened the box. <coughs> sure enough, at the top there were some papers, and Robin went through them, and down at the bottom, he found a sack of gold that jingled. He 
said, for lying, she said to the abbot, for lying to me, I will take all of whatever is in the sack. That will be your toll. And now you may freely go. And so Robin returned to his woods, the abbot returned to his monastery, and the knight lived happily in his manor house, and Robin got his money. <laughs>